Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the NUS Admission Sharing Webinar. I'm Grace, and I'll be your MC for today. Thank you for taking time to join us. The sharing you will hear today will be presented by the Dean of Admissions, Professor Go Se Song. And after his presentation, there will be a QA segment with Prof Go and three NUS students. If you have any questions, we greatly appreciate if you could please write them down in the QA tab below, and we'll answer them towards the end of this webinar. Thank you for your patience. So without further ado, let's begin the webinar. Professor Go Se Song is the Dean of Admissions at NUS. He joined the NUS Department of Mathematics in 1994, and he is passionate about education and has received numerous teaching awards, including the NUS Outstanding Educator Award in 2009. His research interests include the theory and application of wavelets, approximation theory, and harmonic analysis. So may I now invite Prof Go to share about the NUS experience, important considerations when selecting your course of studies, global opportunities, as well as the process and timeline of admissions application. Prof Go, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grace. A very warm welcome to all of you. And uh, we, uh, we hope to see you in NUS soon. And uh, first, let me start off by sharing screen and then I'll get my slides up and then we get going. Okay, so uh, let, let me first give you a brief introduction about NUS and what are the learning opportunities available. And before we do that, let me highlight to you the current paradigm shift in university education. The many of you are thinking about the next step of your education, going to the university. But going to the university has changed from the days of your parents, of your grandparents, and now the university education is beyond a paper qualification. It's beyond an accumulation of knowledge. Instead, this is the place where you get to integrate disciplinary knowledge and future-ready skills. And in terms of pedagogies, in terms of teaching, it's completely different from what you're going to see in the school or in your JCs or, or in, in high school. And instead, what we're going to have is that instead of only purely lecture and tutorial, there are a wide range of pedagogies. It could be seminar style, it could be lecture and tutorial, it could even be a mix of online and face-to-face -face learning. And at the same time, we do understand that the world is changing. And because the world is changing, so we need to provide interdisciplinary learning opportunities for you. We need to make sure that you are able to solve the complex problems of tomorrow where different disciplines can have to come together to solve one particular problem. At the same time, we want you to have a global learning opportunities for, for you to see the world and to connect up with different parts of the world. And last but not least, career preparation is of utmost importance to us. We need to make sure that our graduates are well prepared for their career and to, in many of our courses, and in fact, most of our courses, there are internship opportunities for you as well. And what are the considerations in choosing a course of study? I'm sure many of you have asked this question, what should I study in the university? And for to answer this question, I think there are two basic questions that I will ask back to you. Now, what are the two basic questions that I will ask you? That is, what is your passion? What is your aptitude? These are the two most important things that, that I hope you, you take into account when you choose the course of study, passion and aptitude. If you're good at something, you'll, you'll be passionate about this. On the other hand, if you're passionate about something, most likely, this will translate into your aptitude in it as well. So these two things are actually well connected. And looking for a course that you're passionate about, that you're good at, this is going to help you. And during the course of study, you acquire knowledge and skill sets related to this and will help you to actually integrate these two things together. Your first job after graduation, most likely will be related to what you are studying. And that is where you really need to be good at. You really need to be passionate about what you're going to do. Because, because this is, if you are passionate, 
and you are good at, this is something that is going to last you for a long time. And welcome to the NUS experience. And uh, just to, as a quick snapshot about what you have to offer. Now, NUS is uh, consistently ranked among the best universities in Asia and the top 25 universities globally. We are a research-intensive, comprehensive university. This year, we are 117 years old. We are the largest and the oldest university in Singapore. And because of our size, because of the wide range of expertise that we have, we can offer more than 60 bachelor's degree programs. At the same time, we have very vibrant student life. We have more than 200 clubs and societies and interest group on campus. At the same time, well, Singapore is at one corner of the world. We are well connected to more than our 300 uh, three, more than 300 partner universities in over 40 countries. And our graduates are very employable. We are among the top 10 for global employability. And more about the NUS stories. Like I said, NUS is Singapore's first and largest university. We have taught generations of architects, doctors, engineers, lawyers, entrepreneurs, writers, scientists, and so on and so forth. And being a research intensive university, our research impacts lives as well. And we are just getting started. Let me summarize what is the NUS education about. I can summarize this as the three C's of NUS education, customizable, challenging, and current. How we are going to make it work, that is entirely up to you. And the first thing you do when you apply to the university, choose a course of study, choose an academic pathway. Now, so what are the courses that we offer? Now, if you're interested in humanities and sciences, you can apply to the humanities and sciences course and you can pick any of the majors under them. You can major in arts and social sciences. You can do a major in science or you can even look at something that we call a cross-disciplinary program that integrates two areas together. Like for example, data science and economics. And we integrate everything together for you as a package. If you are interested in design and engineering, apply for a major in uh, design in the, the College of Design and Engineering. You can do a major in design or you can do a major in engineering. And you notice that in terms of engineering, you just need to apply to the course engineering. There are many, many majors in all different areas of engineering. Under the course, you can embark on any one of them. And the moment you are in the engineering course, you can choose any of these. No, no further selection. Our school of business actually is very strong. We offer three different courses, accountancy, business administration, and real estate. Our school of computing offer four different kinds of courses in computing, business analytics, computer science, information security, and information systems. At the same time, we have professional courses like medicine, dentistry, and law. We even have a music school. And for those who are interested in healthcare, we have courses on nursing and pharmacy as well. And let me explain to you how does the NUS education works. And this can be framed under our four key pillars of NUS education. Essentially, an NUS education has three components. The first component is what we call the major requirements. And that is roughly about one third of the, course, uh, of the modules that you're going to study. The second component is what we call a common curriculum. A common curriculum that forms the foundation, the base to facilitate your study in your major requirements. And that is the about, again, one third of your curriculum space. Then if you ask yourself, what is the remaining one third? That is the exciting part. The remaining one third is going to be what we call unrestricted electives. What is unrestricted electives? We let you paint the rainbow in the way that you want. You choose what you want to do. You make it, we make it happen for you. So that is the third component. And with these three components, that forms the four key pillars of NUS education. Common curriculum. Common curriculum that is to form the base at the broad base intellectual foundation so that we can expand your learning capacity. Second part, flexible pathway. Why is it possible? Because we have the unrestricted electives part. We let you do whatever that you desire. 
if you are very passionate about your major, you want to go a lot deeper. One third is not enough for you. Make it two third. You use all the modules under the unrestricted elective space to further deepen your expertise in that major. On the other hand, you want to have multiple competencies. You want to complement your primary major by a second major or a minor. That is possible. So flexible pathway. The third thing is that because of this flexibility, you can actually do an interdisciplinary approach in your learning. You can bring two disciplines together. You can complement your major with a minor. Let's say your major is in uh, uh, mechanical engineering and you want to go deep into aeronautical engineering so that you use some of your unrestricted elective space to do a specialization in aeronautical engineering. There's still a little bit of space that you can complement it further with doing a minor in, let's say, physics. So that is where you can actually integrate different disciplines together. And at the end of the day, our complement to our students is not just the four years of NUS education. We want you to be well prepared for lifelong learning. And we have a wide suite of uh, lifelong learning courses that you can come back for continual education after your graduation, maybe be 20 years after your graduation. And let me give you a few examples of the kind of courses that we have. Last year, we launched the College of Humanities and Sciences, and we took in more than 2,000 students. This is a virtual college that provides an enhanced undergraduate experience for students of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Science. These two are two of the oldest and largest faculties in Singapore. And you can imagine the interdisciplinary learning that we provide to these students at scale. The scale of impact is big. Now, for students who entered the College of Humanities and Sciences, they will do a common curriculum. A common curriculum, not common for the whole university, but common for the College of Humanities and Sciences. The common curriculum is specially curated to facilitate studies in humanities and sciences. Then they, they will also get to choose a major. And a major could be something in arts and social sciences or a major in science. That is up to you. We let you choose. And after that, you can still double up with a second major or with a minor or study something else or go deeper into your major. So you can imagine the amount of flexibility that we are offering you. Another example, the College of Design and Engineering. And this is a merger between the Faculty of Engineering and the School of Design Environment, which has been around for a long time as well. And we are launching it for this year's incoming cohort for the College of Design and Engineering. Greater choice, greater breadth, more flexibility for student-centric curriculum. Once again, the same idea. There is a common curriculum. This time, the components of the common curriculum comes in terms of the areas of design and engineering. Then they will choose a major. If you're interested in design, you're interested in architecture, industrial design, go for that. On the other hand, if you are, wanted to be an engineer, apply to the engineering course, and then you can pick any of the majors under the engineering course. This is a new development in the sense that in the past, you have to apply directly to that course of study, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Now we want to give students more choice. The moment you are into the engineering course, you can pick any of the majors that you desire so that you will actually get to pursue what you are really, really passionate about. And once again, there is a space of unrestricted electives. We have specializations that I've alluded just now and for, for the College of Design and Engineering, go for the specialization or you can complement your study with a second major or minor. Second major or minor need not be within the College of Design and Engineering. You can go to other colleges like College of Humanities and Sciences to do a second major or minor. That is entirely up to you. And another innovation that we are launching in this new academic year, which is uh, starting next week, which is NUS College. What is NUS College? 
NUS College is the first undergraduate honors college of NUS that allows you to enhance your chosen major. And this brings together the best features of our more than 20 years university scholars program plus Yale NUS College. And every year we take in four to 500 students to the NUS College. Now, the key point here is that NUS College being an honors college means that it's an add-on to the course of study. All students will have a course of study in one of those that I've already mentioned. May it be in School of Business, School of Computing, College of Humanities and Sciences, College of Design and Engineering. Now, the key point here is that this is open to more than 50 majors in the university that, that encompasses academic depth and breadth. But NUS College has its own common curriculum that brings that's innovative, that's immersive, and bring different disciplines together. And what happens here is that instead of doing the common curriculum of your home faculty or your home college, you actually will do the common curriculum of NUS college. And this is small class teaching, and you, you actually have two years of on-campus stay as well. You stay with a nice, close, tight-knit community in our university town that you can make friends and interact and take classes with friends from different parts of the university of different discipline. And like I said, the unrestricted elective space gives a lot of flexibility. You can go beyond a single degree. Now, just now I already mentioned some keywords, second major, minor, and some of you may have questions that come to your mind. What is a second major? What is a minor? What is the difference between this versus a primary major? Let me explain. Typically, for an NUS education of four years, a student will take 40 modules. One year, they will take 10 modules. So the currency is, mod is modules. And for major requirements, which is roughly about one third of the curriculum space, it ranges between 15 to 20 modules, depending on the, the school or the college that you are in. So it's 15 to 20 modules. Most of them is 15 modules. So major requirement, primary requirement, 15 modules. Second major requirement, less intensity, 10 modules. Minor, five modules. So you can actually see that it is possible for you to complement your study using your unrestricted elective space to construct a second major or a minor. And the good news is that we are very flexible. At the point of application, you can apply for a double major combination, a major minor combination. We will give it to you. On the other hand, some of you may say that I want to explore my NUS education first. Then I decide whether I want to pick up a second major or minor. Can I do that? No problem. You can do that as well. And you can even do a DIY that you decide how you want to pair a major and another discipline minor together. So we give our students full flexibility. And even if you go on for a second major along the way, you discover that actually I want to use my space to do something else. I just want a minor. You can move from a second major to a minor or conversely, you have started off with a minor and you feel that I really enjoyed this. I want to go further. You can upgrade yourself to do a second major. All these are possible. Some students want to do a double degree. Then you will say one degree is four years. Double, two, two degrees, double degree is eight years. No, this is not how it works. What happened is that depending on the college you're in, you can get two undergraduate degrees ranging from four to five years. Like for example, in the College of Humanities and Sciences, for certain discipline, certain combination, by leveraging on the common curriculum, you can get a Bachelor of Social Science degree and a Bachelor of Science degree together within four years. That is also possible. And we have many partner universities and you can graduate with a degree, what we call a joint degree offered by NUS and one of our partner universities. And some students are very adventurous. You want to do a concurrent degree. You want to do a bachelor degree and a master degree one after another. And that we have packages under the concurrent degree programs. And we want to support you to learn the way that you want to. Now we do understand that 
transiting from JC, from junior college or from high school to university, there could be quite a big jump. And for the boys who are serving national service, it may take a while to get used from national service life to university life as well. We want to smooth out this transition for you. We also want you to try courses without worrying about the grades. And that is what we call our grade free first year. Some students wanted to try something. Some students take time to get used to university life. Don't worry. In your module, as long as you pass the module, you can opt for what we call an SU option. S for satisfactory, U for unsatisfactory. The moment you pass, you get a satisfactory and the grade will not count towards your graduation. But the, the modular credit that you've accumulated by passing the modules will count towards your graduation requirement. What happens if you like the grade? Please keep the grade, okay? And this can help you to, to, to count towards the grade, uh, grade point average for your final graduation. Now, some students aspire to do research. Some students have opportunities to do research uh, in the JC and you enjoy the experience. In the university, do you have this opportunity to do research? The answer is yes. Now, many students say that I will get to do research in my final year. It doesn't have to wait until the final year. In year two, year three, we have what we call the undergraduate research po program. You can approach one of the professors that you like and you approach him that say that I would like to work together with you in the lab. And this can be formulated under an undergraduate research program. And this again can be counted towards the graduation requirement. We do recognize that there are some modules that you, you are very passionate about that we may not have it. We have opportunity for you to design your own module. You can customize your own learning experience, get a few friends together, approach a professor, and then you can design the modules yourself. And then this can be a, a very fulfilling self-directed learning experience. And like I said, many students want to see the world through our university education. Take advantage of our global learning opportunities. Learn out of your comfort zone. You know, you can develop personal life skills. You can expand the scope of your learning and you apply it to the real world problem. So here is a snapshot and overview of how you can make the world your classroom. Our flagship student exchange program that you can actually spend one semester or one year in one of our more than 300 partner universities. And the some questions that come to your mind is that if I go and spend one semester in a partner university, does it mean that I will graduate one semester later? The answer is no. Under the student exchange program framework, before you go and spend one semester or one year in a partner university, you will talk to an academic advisor in your home faculty and we will map out the modules that you take from your, 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 uh, your exchange universities towards your graduation requirement so that it is possible for you to graduate at the same time. Second question, is it very expensive to pay for the overseas university school fees? The good news is that if you go for a student exchange program, the fees that you are still be still be paying will be NUS school fees, which is uh, which is well subsidized by the Singapore government under the MOE tuition grant. Some students will say spending one semester or one year is too long. I want to have a taste of going abroad, and can I have a shorter duration? We have what we call summer and winter programs. Shorter duration than student exchange program, and you can spend three to six weeks in a partner university taking some classes. Those of you who are very passionate about research, you can do a research attachment in renowned labs in, in overseas university. And another highlight that we have, which is uniquely NUS, is what we call the NUS overseas colleges. So let me explain what is this NOC. Now, some of you may want to be an entrepreneur. You feel that there's something that you can contribute to this world. And what you can do is that under the NOC framework, you can actually do an internship at a startup for up to one year. This is a very successful program that we have in, in NUS. You work in a startup as an intern and you take some entrepreneur classes in our partner universities. And at the end of the day, there are many students 
actually come back and founded their own companies. And just for record, more than 3,400 NOC students and alumni have gone through the program. And through this process, more than 800 companies have been founded. You get to experience the firsthand experience, uh, firsthand experience as life of an entrepreneur. So here are the different places that we have NOCs, NUS overseas colleges. You can go to North America, Silicon Valley, New York. You can uh, do it in Europe or Middle East or China or Southeast Asia. And there are all these different places that you can actually experience life as an entrepreneur. Now, some of you may say that, does it mean that I really, really need to go overseas before I can uh, find all the exciting parts of NUS education? Not to worry, that is not the case. Our campus itself is already very, very interesting and very exciting. You can make yourself home at the campus. And campus accommodation has really grown in the past few years. In the past, in the old days, NUS only have what we call the traditional halls of residence. Shears Hall, Rifles Hall, Yusok Ishak Halls. Some of your parents, if they are NUS graduate, probably they have stayed in these halls of residence as well. These halls of residence with their strong traditions, they are still there. And you get a place to stay and you also have a lot of activities with friends and uh, students from different faculties. So that is the horse of residence. About 10 plus years ago, we formed the university town. And that's where we have introduced the concept of residential colleges. You have a place to stay. And at the same time, you have lots of activities, but there's an additional component. You get to do some classes, up to five modules that can be counted towards your common curriculum. That is residential colleges. NUS College is the third type, and this is the new key on the block. This is the one that we introduced this year. Similar concept as a residential college, a place to stay, lots of activities, taking classes. But the taking classes component is actually more than five modules. We are looking at 14 modules, and these modules actually span across even global experience modules. So this is the third type. The fourth type is that some students wanted to have a place to stay, but less activities. And that is what we call student residences. But it doesn't mean that it's just a, a, a hostel and that there's nothing there. That you have a rich culture of different international students in the student residences. You get to make friends uh, in terms of cultural exchange and community building with different students from different parts of the world. And the, the next type is what we call houses, a new concept that we wrote this year. And this actually, again, has a place to stay. They have activities, but this focus on co-creation of, of a safe space for you and you take in uh, for peer mentoring. And there are a lot of initiatives that you can bottom up initiative that you can start off with. So these are the five different types of uh, halls of residence. And our campus life is very very uh, vibrant. You get to connect with like-minded peers. You can embark on music, arts and culture, sports, community service, or you can even start your own special interest group. And like I said, we want to prepare you for future employment. We have a center for future ready graduates that actually organizes programs, workshops, events to prepare you for employment. NUS is 117 years old we have a lot of alumni. And think of it this way. Is it possible for you to interact and network with our alumni in the industry for career planning and job opportunities? We have a platform called NUS Connect that allows you to do this. We also want to facilitate you to do internship. Most of our courses, we have internship, either compulsory or optional internships, but all can be counted towards your graduation requirement. And we also have a platform for you to, to engage in internship search and internship opportunities. So after explaining all this, how do we apply to the university? The first thing is that we need to identify the admission requirements for the qualifications that you are presenting. Now for students in the junior college, you'll be presenting the GCE, Singapore Cambridge GCE A-levels qualifications. Some students in the IB schools will be presenting the IB qualifications. There are students in today's webinar 
that are from overseas, then you have different types of international qualifications. And uh, like from different parts of the world, like Indian 12, Gao Kao, uh, uh, Canadian High School, Australian High School, and so on and so forth. Please go to our website and look for the qualifications that you are in, and you can actually find all the admission requirements. So for today's, I will highlight two of the more common ones uh, that are for the local students, that is the Singapore Cambridge GCE A-Levels and the IB. Our admission process is based on academic merit and meeting subject prerequisite. The, so please take a look at the subject prerequisite that we have to, uh, for a course that you're interested in. This is to make sure that you have the necessary background to actually embark on this course of study. Like for example, if you're interested in pharmacy or pharmaceutical science, chemistry is very important. So make sure that you have the H2 chemistry before you apply. Assessment is based on six Singapore Cambridge GCE A-level subject, three H2 and one H1, GP or knowledge inquiry, project work, and you have to pass the mother tongue requirement. What is unique about NUS admission application is that we do provide bonus points for first choice course. Remember, I highlighted in the beginning that we, we want students to be passionate about something. We want to recognize and support you for your passion. So the course that you put out as a first choice, you will get a bonus point of up to 2.5 bonus point for GCE A-levels for all the courses that do not require interviews or additional tests. IB, similar idea. Again, based on academic merit and subject prerequisite. And we will look at your IB result, maximum 45 IB points. For, for the local students, we need you to clear the mother tongue language requirement as well. Again, we have bonus point awarded for first choice courses for uh, excluding those that requires interviews or tests. And you will get up to, you will get one IB point for your first choice course. And do we have scholarships? How do we support our students? NUS has a wide suite of scholarship. You can go to the website and look at the details. But in a nutshell, for Singapore citizens with outstanding results, strong leadership qualities and potential and good core curricular activities, we do offer our flagship NUS scholarship, which is the NUS Global Merit Scholarship and NUS Merit Scholarship. And for those of you who are specially inclined towards sports or performing and visual arts, we also have NUS scholarships for the, for you as well. And what is unique about NUS scholarship, all of them are bond free. At the same time, full tuition waiver, you don't have to pay school fees and there's a living expenses of uh, $6,000. All the scholarship have these and global merit scholarship have additional support for uh, global exposure. And some students will say, does it mean that it's very expensive to study in NUS? Now, our admission policy is merit-based and needs-blind. Financial difficulty will not impact the way that we assess you. And we actually have a wide range of uh, financial aid that's available for our students. We have government bursaries like HECB and HEB bursaries. NUS have their own bursaries to top up what the government bursaries offers to you. And for those of you who wanted to stay in on campus, the halls, or the uh, residential colleges, and you find that it's challenging because of the cost, not to worry, we also have bursaries for on-campus stay. To go overseas for our student exchange program, if you're a needy student, we also have bursary for our, what we call the study abroad bursaries. At the same time, if all this support is not sufficient, we still have tuition fee loan, we have our own NUS study loan and student assistance loan. And you can estimate the expenses for our based on our financial needs calculator on our website. And we are fully committed to actually uh, increase the access to NUS education for needy full-time Singaporean undergraduate students. So this year, starting from this academic year, we're going to enhance our financial aid scheme for needy full-time Singaporean undergraduate students. So let me explain this in a nutshell. The per capita income. That means the total income in the family divided by the number of members in your family. If the PCI is not more than $1,000, NUS bursary, you, you will get government bursary to defray some of the cost of the tuition fees at the same time. But if it's not enough, 
NUS bursary will top up everything for you so that there will be full coverage of tuition fees. So you don't have to pay any tuition fees. If your PCI is not more than 690, not only you have full coverage of tuition fees, we will provide you with $4,000 per year for living expenses. At the same time, we want you to have a full fetch of the NUS education with possibly of one semester or one year of on-campus stay plus an overseas program exposure. That we already have bursaries, but some students find that it's not enough. So for students with PCI not more than 690, we have the Opportunity Enhancement Grant. They will top up the financial aid for you as well. And in a nutshell, show us your strength when you apply for admission. We want to take into account your interest and the passion. Choose your course wisely so that you can make good use of the first choice bonus point. At the same time, if you if you find that your rank points may not be enough, but you have other abilities, we recognize them under our aptitude-based admission. We look at your ability, your interests, your leadership, your community service, your exceptional talent. Fill up the information under the achievement section. So this is a to-do list a checklist. Mark down the important dates. Look at the subject prerequisite, you know, and uh, you can apply for admission. At the same time, you can apply for scholarship. You can also apply for financial aid. Three different portals for you to apply. And this is the timeline. Different qualifications has different timeline. Again, check our website. Like for example, for Singapore Cambridge A-level students, you can start applying after the release of A-level results, probably around 24th of February for admission, financial aid, and scholarship. Then the portal will close on 19th of March. And then from March to May, we will release the outcome of admission from scholarship and uh, financial aid as well. For IB students, the portal opens earlier. As early as mid-October, you can already apply for admission and financial aid. Scholarship portal will uh, open in February. Again, the, when you close, we start to assess and then we roll out the offer until around May. So if you need more information, please visit our website or you can send in inquiries under nus.edu stroke us admissions. Thank you very much. And uh, I will stop here. Thank you, Prof Bo, for your sharing. We will now move on to the Q&A segment. We have ex especially invited three NUS students, Shamin, Teddy, and Caitlin, to share with us today. Shamin is a final year student majoring in sociology from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences under the College of Humanities and Sciences. She is an alumnus of St. Joseph's Institution International. Shamin spent three, two years as a resident of Tumbusu College and is now residing at Richview Residential College. An active student ambassador leader, she enjoys the vibrant NUS campus life and particularly benefited from the flexibility of the FASS curriculum that allows her to explore modules and eventually find her passion and excel in her major. Shamin recently completed her summer exchange program at the London School of Economics, where she had a stimulating experience venturing beyond her comfort zone and interacting with people from all walks of life. Teddy is a third-year student majoring in accountancy from the NUS Business, School, NUS Business School. He is a recipient of the NUS Merit Scholarship and is an alumnus of Catholic Junior College. Teddy was the head of his residential block at Kenridge Hall, where he led, planned, and executed huge-scale events such as freshman orientation programs, welcome hall camps, as well as the NUS Scholars Retreat for fellow scholars. He plays regularly for the NUS Recreational Volleyball Club and is also a student ambassador leader. He is looking forward to his student exchange program to the Netherlands in the upcoming semester. On top of juggling schoolwork and extracurricular activities, Teddy believes in getting a career head start by sourcing for internships during his term break. He's a licensed financial advisor working with the Advisors Alliance Group and, author and authorized representatives of AIA. Caitlin is a second year student from the NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine and is a recipient of the NUS Merit Scholarship. She previously she was previously from Raffles Institution and is now part of Tembusu Residential College. 
In both her faculty and college, she is part of the Dutch rugby team, various other sports interest groups, and partakes in house activities. She also participates in orientation activities as well as several communities centering around digital healthcare, where she learns how medical innovation is used creatively to solve problems of in our healthcare system. So I'll hand the time over to Prof Go, who will be moderating the Q&A segment with Shamin, Teddy, and Caitlin. Prof Go, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ray. And uh, it's a really, really a great pleasure for me to have uh, three of our NUS students to uh, join me for this Q&A. I noticed that you have asked a lot of very good questions during, the, uh, during my presentation. Now, I'll try to answer them together with the three students. But uh, before we begin, maybe let me invite the students to say hello to all of you and uh, to, uh, to say a few words to you. So uh, we will start off by Shamin, uh, then Teddy and uh, Kathleen. Hi, thank you, Prof. Go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shamin. Uh, I'm going to be entering my final year when the school starts, and um, I major in sociology. I've been staying on campus since my freshman year. Currently, I stay in Richview Residential College, but previously, I stayed in Tabusu. So hopefully, if you have any questions on that, I'll be very happy to share. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shamin. Uh, Teddy, over to you. All right. Thanks, Prof. Go. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is Teddy. I'm going into year three in business school with an accountancy major, and I'm excited to go overseas to Netherlands for my exchange. Yeah, so for the past two years, I've been staying in Cambridge Hall and definitely hoping to continue my stay there as well in year three and uh, finally in year four. So any of you guys have questions about, um, you know, staying on campus or like scholarships, business school stuff, I'll be happy to help. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Kathleen? Thanks, Prof. Go. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin. I'm a second year medical student and I'm currently staying in Tembusu College. So I guess a bit about me is that, yeah, I play touch rugby and I'm also interested in medical innovation. So it's, NUS has a lot of opportunities to pursue their interests. So I'm co-president of the Medical Grand Challenge and also part of the Mindline Youth Team. And overall, I've had a really, really wonderful time in NUS and I've really enjoyed my time here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I and I, I noticed that there are a lot of questions coming in and uh, there are some questions about academic matters, but there's one part that I have not had a chance to talk a lot that is about student life on campus. And uh, uh, and uh, the, the three students here, all of them have stayed on campus before. And uh, in fact, uh, Shamin has uh, stayed at two different places, Tembusu College and Richview. So maybe I'll get uh, uh, our students to share more about, you know, accommodation and uh, campus life and uh, NCCAs. So uh, Shamin, would you like to tell us more about Tembusu and uh, Richview? Uh, well, it's really been like quite an experience being in two colleges. Um, they're very different, but they're both really just like similarly exciting. I think Tembusu was a good um, start for me because um, one, one um, special thing about the, about the RCs at Utown is that they have suites. So like I stayed in the suite. So it was a good, like it was a good way to make friends quickly and like easily because you're like living in close proximity with people. And um, in Richview, I kind of pushed myself um, to explore more like um, outside my comfort zone like I created an interest group with one of my closest friends who I actually made in the college itself so I think from my experience in Tembusu I, I managed to gather all these like um, interests and passions and like um, kind of like contributed it to whatever RV had to offer as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's very nice and, uh, and uh, Shamin actually uh, you know at Tembusu uh, you actually take uh, uh, some modules that can be counted towards your general education requirements. Now, I, I saw some questions uh, that's posted by the participants that they were saying that, uh, you know, how come the uh, common curriculum and if you stay in the college is less? Now, basically, what happened is that in all the different common curriculums, uh, there is a component of what we call a general education requirement that we actually want all our students to have an experience with. And so, and uh, what happens is that in Tembusu colleges or the, uh, some of the residential colleges, the modules that you have taken actually is counted towards the general education requirement, which is a subset of the common curriculum. So, uh, Shami, would you like to elaborate a little bit more about the, the, the so-called modules that you have taken in Tembusu College? Uh, okay, so I guess I can 
talk about one that I like the one that I did at the, my last semester because I think that's the one I remember the most and it was like my favorite one so it was about negotiation in a complex world so it, it was kind of um at first it was we thought it was like kind of a challenging mod module but then it was kind of learning about how negotiations happen like around the world and also in like past histories as well and it can happen like in any any shape or form like there can be negotiation about chocolate negotiation about coffee so you may think it's a complex thing but even like simple things need negotiation and at the end of that module we got to um, carry out a showcase I'm not sure if Caitlin has like been to that but like you should if you haven't so like you they basically the students like showcase like their negotiation work um uh, what they've done for the past semester and they like presented to other students so it's really interesting to like attend and also to facilitate yeah I see. Okay. Okay. So, so you can actually see that uh, that the kind of learning there is can be very innovative and is actually combining living and uh, experiences uh, and classroom and living experience together. Now, of course, in the traditional hall, like Kenridge Hall, that that Teddy stay in is a different thing. A lot of activities, very strong culture, and uh, I think uh, Teddy is uh, very much into the. Uh, in Kenridge Hall, and uh, can you share with us more about your experiences in Kenridge Hall? How, how is it different from like those in residential colleges? Uh, okay, thanks, Prof. Go. Yep, so um, for Kenridge Hall, right, so I guess the main difference is that we are more focused on, um, you know, activities, taking part in curricular activities. So for example, for myself, previously in year two, I was head of the residential block um, of uh, C-Block, which allowed me to take care of like a hundred different residents um, under my block. So we planned activities for all of them. On top of that, I also played four different sports and I was also part of the heritage committee where to plan um, events for the entire hall as well, which is, comes to about 500 um, residences, yeah, residents. So I guess the main focus of um, living in a residential hall would probably be um, not so much focused towards academic modules, but more towards uh, interacting more with other people, uh, taking part in more activities, and mostly getting more exposure to different things. So this is where, for example, in JC or in secondary school, you guys, uh, we all will have taken part in ladies like maybe one spot only. But here in NUS, in the halls, uh, we take part in different things for us to get exposed to everything that we always wanted to try, but didn't get a chance to in the past. Yeah, And uh, the most important um, thing that I felt uh, I could take away the most for my last two years in residential halls um, was that I made a lot of friends, you know, I learned a lot of new things. Uh, I really put myself out there and I grew a lot as a student, uh, as a leader. And yeah, I really had a, a wonderful time there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think Teddy is totally spot on, you know, university education. Yes. Learning disciplinary knowledge, learning things is one thing, but learning life skills, learning, uh, to grow holistically. I think that is the other aspect. I think the whole aspect actually gave, uh, Teddy a great, uh, Great, great head start in this direction. Now, for Caitlin, you know that uh, I noticed that you are a student in medicine, and uh, medicine is a very demanding course. I'm sure everybody knows that. And uh, you, you're still involved in touch rugby, and you stay in Tambusu, and your your various work in digital uh, healthcare. How do you manage it? You know, how do you manage from this transition of JC to university, and with this wide range of you know, super demanding course and a wide range of uh, uh, activities. Uh, can you uh, share some experiences with us about how, how you do it, actually? Thanks, Prof Gold. So I know this is probably a concern that those of you coming to medicine may have because you hear it's like, oh, it's very stressful, it takes a lot of work. But I think the question isn't so much like, oh, how do you manage it? How do you strike a balance? But more of like, what sort of balance do you want to strike? Because honestly, in NUS, and because I stay in residential college as well, there are so many things to do. There's so many activities to take part in. And if for example, if you really wanted to study medicine, you can study medicine all your life and never be done. It's very easy mm -hmm. for med school to become your life. So it ultimately depends on like what sort of university experience you want. So for example, for me personally, when I came into first year, I was like, okay, I just finished A-levels. I'm ready to have fun. So academics was really not at the top of my priority list. Of course, I would like meet the basic requirements, make sure I pass decently well. But I definitely did not like kill myself trying to study everything. And also, I think it's more of like, yeah, deciding what your priorities are and then making sure that you fulfill your basic requirements and then you use the rest of your time in order to pursue your interests outside. Yeah. 
That's very good. Yeah. And uh, you know that another aspect that in my presentation, I highlighted, you know, study abroad programs, uh, make the world the classroom. And, uh, you know, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, there are quite a lot of students who didn't get a chance to go for a study abroad program due to the travel restriction. But now, finally, we are opening up. And, uh, you know, I, I met uh, Charmaine for quite a number of years already. And uh, I always felt that it's a pity that she didn't get a chance to go. But finally, she went for a summer exchange at London School of Economics. And uh, Charmaine, can you share with us how is it like? And uh, what what are the perspectives that you gain from this student exchange program that you didn't get uh, or originally and how it enhanced and enriched your NUS education? I really thank you, Pramgo. Um, Yeah, it was definitely a really rewarding experience if I could uh, just put one word to it. Um, I think I'm finally, I'm, I feel really fortunate to finally be able to get that. But I think having just a short summer exchange was just nice for me because I also wasn't sure about going on like a longer exchange. So I think this was just nice as a mini taster. And I think my friends and I really, really enjoyed it. Like, because uh, firstly, um, a new perspective that I like took on was um, to take um, a module that wasn't part of my major. So I took it as a UE, it was a journalism mod, which I'm not familiar with at all. But it was really interesting because LSC like brought in guest speakers who were actual journalists and all of that. So it was really nice to actually see them in, in, in real life in the classroom. And also just like, just having your classmates be from people from all over the world. Like it's already a lot on its own because you get so many perspectives that you you never even like thought about before like the way they think it's like wow and then they hear from you and then they're like oh you think that way but like it's, it's not like a debate or anything it's just like oh it's interesting that you think that way like so it's very refreshing that we're learning new things like even at this age like we think we already learned so much but there's just a lot more so that's definitely something that I'll take away and I'll keep with me for a long time. Mm. So, so would you uh, recommend our students to take part in all these student exchange opportunities? Yes. You know, study abroad yes. programs? Yes, definitely highly recommend it. Even if highly recommend it. Yeah, uh -huh. just try it. Just, just consider it and try it out. Maybe bring your friends along if you're, if you're worried. Yeah, it's good to have that comfort as well. Yeah. Ken, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, another aspect I highlighted was we talked about career preparation. Career preparation is very important. And like I said, uh, most of our courses has uh, internship opportunities. And in fact, in uh, business school, it's a compulsory internship. And uh, I think Teddy has gone with, uh, proceeded with internship. And he, as a student, as an accountancy student, he's already a licensed financial advisor and he's also involved with AIA. So can, can you explain to our prospective students about uh, how is it like to uh, that, that transit from what you study in the textbook to internship? And how do you actually, I'm curious, how do you actually got yourself to be a licensed financial advisor at such a young age? Uh, okay. <laughs> yep. So um, I guess um, majority of what we study and learn in the classrooms over here in B school, especially for accounting, um, definitely, you know, you have to have real life experience in order to understand how to apply it from classroom um, over to real world. So the story of how I became a licensed financial advisor actually stemmed from my hall. So my hall itself has a few other advisors as well. So this is when I met one of them who was my senior and he was the one who introduced me to this uh, potential career path, uh, which I could explore as a student. So I thought to myself, you know, if I have four years um, in university, I could either focus on just studying or I could go and study and at the same time, try to apply this outside uh, and potentially build a career for myself. So uh, in my job as a financial advisor, I have the opportunity to, you know, help families, help individuals plan financially. So this is where I literally take whatever I learned from my finance and accounting modules. And I just use it to do some form of financial calculations, um, planning for my friends, uh, my family members, and, you know, everybody else. Yeah, so I, uh, I think it's a very, very rewarding um, experience, even though it may come with multiple challenges. Because on top of just working, I have to focus on my whole life as well, where I have my duties. And on top of that, I have to focus on sustaining my GPA, uh, which is my studies. So yeah, it definitely is was very challenging for the past two years, um, juggling all of this. But nevertheless, I think um, it's a very good experience uh, trying this out. And, you know, for those of you who are going into business or, you know, actually any faculty um, whatsoever, it's, it's a good opportunity for you guys. Um, to take on something other than just your studies to help grow yourself as a student and as a person as well. Yeah. 
That, that, that is excellent advice to our prospective student. You know, uh, the NUS education is customizable. How you make it work is entirely up to you. And most importantly, you should craft it as having a holistic experience, not just purely study, but study well, do well, and all the other things. And all the other things actually will add up to actually enhance your both your discipline knowledge and skill set. Now, that there is some uh, quite a number of questions and interests about medicine application. And uh, this medicine application, you know, that uh, it is, of course, more complicated than just purely our, you know, regular admissions to like the other more standard causes. So I think uh, I would like to invite Kathleen to uh, answer some of the questions or to address about, to describe to you, what was the application process like for medicine? And uh, so Kathleen, please. Okay, thanks, Prof. Yes, okay, let me try to recall. I won't go too much in detail about the medicine actual application process because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of details you can find online. So like just to run through it briefly, you apply a general application to NUS and then uh, medicine will have its own selection procedure, which is much more rigorous, such as you have the situational judgment test. There's like many interview stations if you get to the interview stage. So the interview stations, I'm sure you can read up online, but I think the main thing of note here is that there's a portfolio station in which you have 25 minutes with two interviewers. And I think if there's, okay, the biggest advice I can give you is to prepare yourself well for the interview and, exp and especially to express yourself well, because what I would say that the medicine interview is looking for is mainly around like three things. Firstly, is that you're genuinely interested in medicine because they want to filter out those people who have been pushed into it mainly because perhaps their parents think it's a good career option or because they think it's prestigious. Or, and secondly, that you have the qualities of a good doctor, such as, oh, being empathetic, being a good listener. And lastly, that you have the capacity to like withstand that kind of rigorous education. And so I think the most important thing here is to be able to express that, yes, you do meet these three criteria. And while in JC, I do admit that there's quite like an emphasis on CV building. Like you, a lot of like people who I know last time would try to like go for as many volunteering opportunities or like clinical attachments as possible. I honestly don't think it's necessary. I think what's more important is knowing what you want to say and being able to express that in the interview because they just want to know like genuinely, like why do you want medicine? Why do you think you're a good fit for it? And you don't need like 10 volunteering opportunities to prove it. You just need to be able to like reflect very well about one volunteer experience. Like how has it impacted you? How has it change what you think and being able to show like um, your true like passion, your compassion, your maturity of thought. I think that is what would impress the interviewers most and make the biggest difference at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. I think uh, what you have summarized very aptly, you know, uh, this is not about CV building. And uh, in fact, some students wanted to be considered under aptitude-based admission. And there was always questions about how can we ace the aptitude-based admission. Now, I think at the end of the day, you have to genuinely portray that you have the aptitude and you have the passion for that course that you're applying to. I think that is the key pack here. And I think due to, uh, and I think there are a lot of other good questions, but unfortunately due to time constraint, and there are a lot of other exciting sessions for the rest of the day with the faculties. So uh, I will uh, end this Q&A here and uh, and I just want to have uh, wish all of you uh, all the very best for your studies. And we look forward to receiving your applications to NUS. I'll pass time, time back to Grace. Thank you, Prof. Go, Shamin, Eddie, and Caitlin for sharing your experience, insights, and sound advice. I hope they have managed to answer your questions and clarify your doubts. With that, we have come to the end of the admission sharing and Q&A. Thank you so much for taking time to join us today and we hope this session has been helpful. We also greatly appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill up a feedback form. You may scan the QR code or access the link that we have shared in the chat board. Your feedback is important to us, so please let us know how we can improve. If you have yet to sign up for the admissions and faculty sharing next Saturday, 6th of August, do register and hear from the respective NUS colleges, faculties and schools. You may register via the QR code or the link provided. So thank you once again and my colleagues and I look forward to receiving your application and warmly welcoming you to NUS. Have a great day ahead. Goodbye.